grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Eun Seo Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Ricefield United Methodist Church. I want to welcome you to this worship service at the Vine, an online campus of Ricefield United Methodist Church. We are grateful to worship together. When we sing, when we pray, when we share together, God is right here with us. We pray that God will touch your heart and listen to your prayers during this worship service. As we continue our sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit, today, Pastor Julia Hayes will be delivering the message about joy. So I want to invite you to open your heart and mind to experience what the Lord is doing within us. Let this joy guide us throughout our lives, filling us with the peace and love of God. Now, let us prepare our heart before God and feel the closer to the Lord. Please join me in our opening congregational prayer. The words will be shown on your screen. God, make us fertile soil. In this time of worship, till our hearts so that we will grow your fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In our daily lives, keep us from striving and instead help us trust the work you are doing in us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Pastor David Haley, I'm 
one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church, and I have the privilege of leading us in prayer today. As I lead us in prayer, let's be sure to remember the suffering across the world from natural disasters and warfare, and let us also remember that we observed this past week a solemn day of remembrance of acts of terrorism in our country on September 11th. And I'll pause during the prayer for you to be able to speak the names of persons that you would like to especially remember in prayer today. Let us pray. Oh God, in a world that seems to have gone crazy and lost its way, we come to you today, not just seeking answers, but seeking strength and courage for the days ahead. We pray for courage to be the people you have called us to be, people who seek justice and peace through your love for all your people. We seem to be a deeply divided people, but as we look and listen to people around the world, so many seem divided and at war with one another, either through words or worse, through acts of violence. Surely we humans must test your patience. But we know that your love is all-encompassing, never-ending, always forgiving. This is our hope, that you love us unconditionally, for we know that in the end, it is you who loves us the most. And you are always there waiting for us. You are our hope for the world. And it is in this hope that we live and move and have our being. You are our joy that sustains us through the challenges of life. We pray today for all those who are struggling in body, mind, and spirit. We especially pray today for these whom we now name with our voices or in our hearts. Hear our prayers, O Lord. As we worship you today, we pray for your grace and for your joy. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us and is still teaching us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, it's time now for the children's sermon. If you have children or youth nearby who are not already watching this video, now's a great time to call them over because I've got something to share with them and with you. So, hey guys, I'm Pastor David again from uh, Wrightsville United Methodist Church, one of the associate pastors. And I wanna share with you today one of my favorite books. It's called The Wonky Donkey. All right, let's see what this book is all about. I was walking down the road and I saw a donkey. Hee-haw, and he only had three legs. He was a wonky donkey. I was walking down the road and I saw a donkey. Hee-haw, he only had three legs and only one eye. He was a winky wonky donkey. I was walking down the road and I saw a donkey. Hee-haw! He only had three legs, one eye, and he liked to listen to country music. He was a honky-tonky, winky-wonky donkey. I was walking down the road 
and I saw a donkey. Hee-haw! He only had three legs, one eye, he liked to listen to country music, and he was quite tall and slim. He was a lanky, honky-tonky, winky-wonky donkey. I was walking down the road, and I saw a donkey. Hee-haw! He only had three legs, one eye, he liked to listen to country music, he was quite tall and slim, and he smelled really, really bad. He was a stinky, dinky, lanky, honky, tonky, winky, wonky, donkey. I was walking down the road, and I saw a donkey. He haw He only had three legs, one eye. He liked to listen to country music. He was quite tall and slim. He smelled really bad. And that morning, he got up early, and he hadn't had any coffee. He was a cranky, stinky-dinky, lanky, honky-tonky, winky-wonky donkey. I was walking down the road, and I saw a donkey. Hee-haw! He only had three legs, one eye. He liked to listen to country music. He was quite tall and slim. He smelled really bad. That morning, he got up early and hadn't had any coffee, and he was always getting into mischief. He was a hanky-panky, cranky, stinky-dinky, lanky, honky-tonky, winky-wonky donkey. I was walking down the road, and I saw a donkey. Hee-haw! He only had three legs, one eye. He liked to listen to country music. He was quite tall and slim. He smelled really, really bad. That morning, he got up early, and he hadn't had any coffee. He was always getting into mischief but he was quite good looking. He was a spunky, hanky-panky, cranky, stinky-dinky, lanky, honky-tonky, winky-wonky donkey. I was walking down the road and I saw a donkey. Hee-haw! Well, that's the end of the story. Now, why would I read this book for children's sermon? Simply because a book like this, a story like this, puts a smile on our faces. And today we're thinking about joy as one of the fruits of the Spirit. Now joy is more than just a smile on our faces, but it is certainly that. Joy is the feeling in our hearts that even when we go through hard or difficult times, we can still be joyful because we know that God loves us and God has promised to always be with us. Let's pray. Lord God, we just pray that you'll put a smile on our faces, but also put joy in our hearts, even when we go through the hard times in life. Help us to always be thankful that you are with us and that you love us. We pray for the children and youth of our church and community and their families and pray your blessings on them. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to get to bring you our message today. Our scripture today is a part of our whole fall long sermon series where we're looking at the fruit of the spirit. And as a part of that, we are encouraging you to work on memorizing along with us the verse that this concept of the fruit of the spirit comes from, which is Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23. The words will be on your screen and I invite you to say this out loud with me now. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Our specific scripture for today comes from John chapter 15, verses 7 through 11, as we are focusing today on the fruit of joy. Hear now this word. If you abide in me 
and my words abide in you. Ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me now in prayer? Holy and loving God, Lord, your people are longing today to hear from you. God, in this time I ask that you would use me to speak to your people. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There's a classic scene in the comedy classic movie, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, where there is a line of pious monks and they're all wandering through the streets chanting. And it goes a little something like this. Pie Jesu Domine, Donna Eis Requiem. If you've seen the scene, you know it. They are trying to punish themselves for their presumed sinful nature. Well, whether or not we would actually admit it or think in our rational minds that that has anything to do with how we see God, the reality is that maybe on a subconscious level, many of us have a huge sense of guilt, the sense that all the things that we're doing are wrong and that we really ought to just be wandering through the streets, lashing ourselves to make up for it somehow. If you've ever felt like that, then maybe it's a surprise to hear these words, that joy is a fruit of the Spirit. If joy is a fruit of the Spirit, that means that joy is produced and comes from relationship with the Holy Spirit, which means that joy must be a characteristic of God. Do you ever struggle to believe that? I recently came across an article on Christianity Today that addresses just this problem of how hard it can be to believe that God is joyful. The author, Joy Marie Clarkson, writes, I am convinced that most of us have a tiny Puritan who lives in our heads. He sees all pleasure as temptation. He thinks the safest way to stay morally pure is to be chronically wary of one's own enjoyment. When we find ourselves enjoying something, be it, be it a particularly overripe peach, an amazing piece of music, or a first kiss, he furrows his brow, grumbling, sinner, be careful, you might get carried away. The tiny Puritan believes all pleasures are guilty pleasures. Did you enjoy that movie? The tiny Puritan suggests you could or should be doing something more productive or spiritual. Did you love those donuts? The tiny Puritan suggests you are a glutton. Maybe you don't have a tiny Puritan in your head. Maybe you don't feel afraid of pleasure, but you don't really see a connection between the things that bring you joy and God. Why would God care about you singing along to your favorite band at Greenfield Lake? or about your first pumpkin spice latte of the season, or about you taking the boat out on a clear sunny day. Whether you feel guilty around joy or just don't see joy as spiritually relevant, the passages we just read are surprising. The passage from John that we just read comes near the end of the Gospel of John, and it's a part of what's sometimes called the farewell discourse. These words come as Jesus is gathered with his disciples and have just shared the Last Supper. The disciples don't know it, but while they are talking with Jesus, 
there are already soldiers on their way to arrest Jesus. Jesus knows that this is his last chance to talk with his disciples on this side of the cross. And what does he say? He reminds them to remain in him, remain in his love, and then says, I have said these things to you so that, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jesus seems to be invested in both his own joy and that joy coming to rest in us. Have you ever considered joy as one of the primary commands of the Christian life? Maybe that seems strange, but if we look at the beginning of scripture and perhaps even at the created world, we can see that joy has been built into the very fiber of creation and of how we were made as human beings. In the narrative in Genesis, God works to create the most beautiful world imaginable in six days. And on the seventh day, rests. Now, God doesn't rest because God is tired, but because joy and excitement enjoying the pleasures of this creation, that was always the point. The world that God created is so good, it demands to be enjoyed. God's joyful nature can be seen even now as we look around at the created world. One of my professors at Duke Divinity School talked about the useless beauty in the world. He meant that there is so much in creation that doesn't need to be as gorgeous as it is. The beauty just is. It doesn't seem to serve any utilitarian function. Those flowers don't have to be such a stunning color, and yet they are. Or imagine spending a day at the North Carolina Aquarium or at a zoo and ask yourself, what kind of God would create all of this? As you watch those silly otters play together or see all the various colors of tropical fish. And honestly, you can't tell me that the God who designed the platypus doesn't have a sense of humor. G.K. Chesterton was reflecting once upon the nature of God as revealed in creation. And it occurred to him that God is somewhat like a little child who, once the child finds something that excites him, wants to do it again and again and again and again. Chesterton wrote this, Perhaps God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never gotten tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy. For we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we. We can see the joy of our creator as we look at creation. We can also see the joy of God in the scriptures, particularly by looking at Jesus. You know, they say that you only have one chance to make a first impression. And Jesus certainly made an impression with his first miracle, according to the Gospel of John. You've probably heard the story. Jesus is at a wedding with his family and his disciples, and the hosts run out of wine. Now, the tiny Puritan would say that this is for the best. Clearly, this means that it's time for people to wrap it up and for everyone to go home and be to bed by a sensible hour so that they can get back to work tomorrow. But that's not how Jesus reacts. When his mother points out the problem, he does initially shy away. He responds, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. 
But notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say, why do you involve me? I have better things to do than handle a catering emergency. Or why do you involve me? This will teach everyone not to care about earthly things. Jesus' hesitation isn't because providing more wine would be out of character for him or unrelated to his mission. Instead, the hesitation is because it's actually so emblematic of his mission that he knows that if he performs this miracle, his ministry will have officially started and there will be no going back. Not only does Jesus turn the water into wine, but to do so, he uses six stone jars that were typically used for ritual washing. There were high standards for the vessels. They were made of stone because it was less porous than clay, and so it would be easier for them to be kept pure. By filling the jars with wine, Jesus makes them unclean. They will no longer be able to be used for cleansing rituals. In his very first miracle, Jesus chooses joyful celebration over ritual purity. And this isn't a one-off. The idea that joy is central to God's nature is found all over the Gospels. A woman poured out an extravagant gift of perfume on Jesus' feet, and people criticized her, saying that she should have spent the money on the poor. But Jesus celebrated her and called what she did a beautiful thing. While the disciples were worried about his dignity, Jesus got on the ground to play with giggling, messy, energetic kids. And in the parables Jesus tells, the kingdom of heaven is described as a giant dinner party and God as the host who wants as many friends around the table as possible. God is a woman who was so excited she found her lost coin, she called her friends in the middle of the night so that they could be excited too. God is a father who throws a blowout party when his rebellious son comes crawling back. And when Jesus knows he has just one night left with his disciples, what does he do? He invites them all to dinner. Even today, God has laid a feast before us. The world is bursting with beauty, with reasons to laugh, with opportunities for joy. God has invited us to enjoy all of these good gifts. The question is, will we accept the invitation? When the world shut down in March of 2020, I was on spring break and visiting my family in Ohio. With all my divinity school classes moved online and so much fear about what might be to come, I decided to stay put and ended up actually staying through the summer. In the midst of this time when it felt like the whole world was falling apart, I began to hear a surprising invitation during my prayer time. God wants me to have fun. Well, normally when such a random thought comes to me unbidden while praying, I assume that it might be from God. But I just couldn't believe that this was from God. God wants me to have fun? Seriously? with the way the world is now? How can I have fun when thousands of people are dying every day? When others are being laid off and losing their ability to provide for their families? When we are in the midst of a racial reckoning? I just couldn't believe it. Even saying the phrase, God wants me to have fun out loud felt irresponsible. But God started working on me. One day I was walking in the neighborhood and saw kids jumping on a trampoline. I felt a rush of nostalgia because as a kid, I would jump on a trampoline for hours and have the best time. The next day while walking again, another neighbor had put a mini trampoline on the curb with a sign that said, free. Talk about a God wink. I walked past it three more times before I finally picked it up and brought it home with me. 
but still I struggled to believe that this invitation to fun was real. About a week later, as the weather started getting hot, my mom and I started joking about and then actually considering buying one of those inflatable above ground pools. We looked online and found the model that seemed like the best fit and decided to order it. But it was out of stock absolutely everywhere, so we just let it go. Well, a few days after that, I was doing our monthly target run for essentials. When I started walking by the aisle with the water toys, goggles, inner tubes, and pool noodles, and I felt this little urge to go check if they had any inflatable pools. Now, I knew for a fact that I wouldn't find any. As I said, there were no pools available within 100 miles of my house at Target, Walmart, Costco, Home Depot, or Lowe's. But still, I felt this nudge. And there, sitting right in front of me on the middle shelf, was one big box holding an inflatable pool. And not just any inflatable pool, the exact one that my mom and I had picked out online. It was so absurd, so over the top, that I finally threw up my hands and said, okay, God, you win, I believe you. That summer, I spent just about every spare moment in that inflatable pool. I splashed around and laughed. I even fit a hot pink inner tube in it and would float around and look up at the sky. Every time I got in that pool, I may as well have been playing in the waters of baptism. It was grace, pure grace poured out by God out of sheer love for me and out of sheer delight. Maybe joy is an acceptance of our liminal nature. When we delight in something, when we let the sheer joy of a moment outshine the darkness of the world, we are acknowledging in some small way that we are not in control, that the whole weight of the universe does not rest on our shoulders. That if we stop working and worrying long enough to be caught up in the taste of a peach, the laugh of a baby, the softness of a blanket, the world as we know it will not fall to pieces. We can afford to enjoy the world because the world doesn't revolve around us. Friends, the banquet is laid before you. God, who is inherently joyful, is urging you to take a seat, to delight in the feast prepared by sheer grace. Will you accept the invitation? Join me in prayer. Holy and loving God, we thank you for your joy. We thank you that you give us joy and give us delight in our lives. Lord, help us to accept your invitation to enjoy you. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go now to experience God's joy. And as you go, may the spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ, Go before you to show you the way. Go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own. Go above you to watch over you and protect you. Go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand. Go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace.